Good afternoon and welcome to Smithsonian Gardens and the National Museum of African American History and Culture for another session, another webinar on Let's Talk African American Gardens. We are delighted to have you join us today and excited to hear more about our speaker, but first a little bit of housekeeping. We ask that you put your questions in the chat box so that Carla and I can go ahead and uh, review them and then ask them to our speaker at the end of the presentation. We ask you to uh, be able to share more information about what you would like to learn about African American gardens, because that will help us find additional speakers. And today we have some, we are recording it, so you'll be able to see the recording in our video uh, library. Um, but it takes a couple of weeks for us to get the closed captions corrected and to be able to put it up. But Carla Thomas McGinnis is joining me today as a representative from the National Museum of African American History and Culture. So Carla, thank you for joining me and thank you for this whole collaboration. We've been having a lot of fun and I'm really enjoying our speakers and I'm always excited to see what information is going to be shared uh, during these programs. So I forgot to tell you my name. I do have it on there. Thank goodness for Zoom. I, I don't always have to remember, but I'm Cindy Brown. I'm the manager of um, educate, Collections, Education, and Access at Smithsonian Gardens. So Carla, why don't you jump in and tell us a little bit more about our speaker today? Absolutely. Well, first, I just wanted to um, let people know, for those of us who might be joining us um, for the first time as a part of this series, that this series actually came together inspired by the handbook of the Negro Garden Club of Virginia. Um, and so I'm so excited that our, our guest today is gonna talk directly about this garden club and garden clubs in general. There's a chapter in this book um, called 10 Years of Progress by the Negro Garden Clubs of Virginia. So um, I think Meredith has a bit more than 10 years of progress <laughs> to share with us today. Um, so I, um, I, I, I'll get right to it. Let me introduce our, our special guest. Meredith Henny Baker is an educator who holds a graduate degree in history from the College of William and Mary and a certificate in material culture and public history. In 2021, she was a writer in residence at the Library of Virginia and a Virginia Humanities Fellow where she researched change-making women's garden clubs in Virginia. A popular speaker, she's been invited to give book talks at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture, the Smithsonian, the Library of Virginia, the College of William and Mary, um, and the Garden Club of Virginia, and many others. She also spoke at the American Horticultural Society's 2022 National Children and Youth Garden Symposium. Louisiana State University Press published her pioneering research on the Richmond Theater Fire of 1811 in 2012. It was re-released in 2022 as an updated paperback with a foreword by acclaimed novelist Rachel Beanland. The Richmond Theater Fire, Early America's First Great Disaster, was a nominee for the 2012 Library of Virginia Literary Award and won the 2012 Jules and Francis Landry Award, recognizing the most outstanding achievement in the field of Southern studies. Her anticipated next book, Scenic Sisters, how Garden Club Women Changed America is forthcoming from Mary Sue Rucci Press, an imprint of Simon & Schuster. She lives in, in Richmond, Virginia, with her, the Richmond, Virginia area with her family. And we are so excited to have you here with us today. So um, we're going to get out the way and let you take the stage. Definitely. And we're getting lots of questions already and comments. So you're going to be in for it, Meredith. We're excited <laughs> to be able to share it with you. All right. Thank you again. We'll, we'll be here, but silent and, and invisible. Okay. okay. Well, thank you, Carla. And thank you, Cynthia, for the introduction. And thank you for everyone who's coming today and who'll be watching later. Um, I am going to go ahead and share my presentation screen. And we can go ahead and get started. So uh, I'm talking about garden clubs as a place for all. And 
sometimes I have people ask me, when did you start getting interested in garden clubs? That's a fair question. I'm not such a great gardener myself. I try real hard, but um, I'm really fascinated by women's history and especially people who make tremendous amounts of change behind the scenes and might not necessarily get credit for it. So this was more or less the theme of my research when I did my residency in 2021 at the Library of Virginia as part of the Virginia Humanities Fellowship. So um, when I was there, I was looking specifically at Garden Club women and how they were change makers and activists. And I had the suspicion that women's garden clubs were incubators, served as incubators for for women uh, leaders, for policymakers, for activists, that these clubs weren't just tea and tulips, but that they actually uh, powered important movements, especially environmentalism and related policy changes. So here I am in the reading room in this picture, and behind me you'll see is Ann Spencer, a Harlem Renaissance poet, and also she was an exceptional gardener, and I'll talk more about her garden and come back to that at the end. But it was a really inspiring setting to be in and to be able to dig into this research. So uh, I went into the archives. I found uh, the uh, hilariously named Garden Gossip Magazine, which was a early publication of the Garden Club of Virginia. I found some photographs. There were scrapbooks. There were letters written with humor uh, about the goings on of the garden clubs. But considering the impact that the garden clubs had on Virginia, for example, they're largely responsible for our state park system. There really isn't, I think, a corresponding volume of material in the archives. And when I started to look for information about Black women's garden clubs, there was even less. And I guess this wasn't necessarily surprising to me. After all, I read uh, Dr. Ann Fearer Scott's essay where she writes about the women's club movement. And she describes women's clubs as being uh, largely invisible. And she says... Uh, in one of her articles, she talks about going to a conference. She's speaking at this conference and she writes, I was raising the question of why some parts of the past go unnoticed while others are closely examined. I offered as a case in point the history of women's clubs, women's associations, which had been since the beginning of the 19th century, a major force helping to shape American community life. But until the advent of women's history in the 1970s had almost totally escaped historians' notice. And then she adds that one of her colleagues challenged her, my friend Tom, Holt paused a moment, looked quizzical and added, but are not Black women invisible to you? What could I say, she wrote, in the process of lecturing everyone else about the dangers of not seeing what was before one's eyes, I'd exemplify the error, overlooked in one field because the protagonists were Black and in the other because they were female. The histories of Black women and of their organizations are just now beginning to be reconstructed. So this was my thrill to be a part of building, adding a few bricks to this project of trying to reconstruct the story um, of the of women's club and women's clubs in America and the important work that they did, and in particular, women's garden clubs. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about club origins, um, the club objectives, and also clubs at work. What did it look like um, on the street level when people were doing the kind of important work that garden clubs did? So club origins. Um, beginning at the very beginning, in the 1880s and all the way through the 1920s, uh, the progressive era birthed many women's clubs. And the women's club movement really thrived during this time. Why do women's clubs form? Well, part of it was they were responding to a lack of educational opportunities for themselves. At this point in time, women weren't often uh, welcomed into botanical societies. They weren't welcomed into university science programs. They weren't uh, welcomed onto athletic teams. And so they decided to educate themselves. They would form clubs on topics of interest, it could be prohibition, it could be pinochle, it could be science, it could be bicycle riding. And in many cases, it was horticulture and it was gardening that united women together. Um, also, part of the reason that they met together was to respond to a lack of political power. 
at this point in time, women do not have a voice or a vote. Uh, and so they created influential grassroots organizations to try to change policies on the local level and eventually on the national level. And groups like uh, the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs formed uh, to facilitate conversations among these clubs and to help them plan and help them take action in a very organized and strategic way on national issues to really build that power that they had as local clubs into a national force. And uh, in different records that I found, the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs um, did incorporate and did include many Black women's garden clubs. So uh, in addition to uh, overarching general clubs forming on the national level. We also have a lot of national garden clubs that unite to form uh, in the 1910s and 1920s to have uh, better communication, um, more learning opportunities, and also to be able to influence national policy. And some of these groups include the National Garden Clubs, um, the Garden Clubs of America, Women's National Farm and Garden Association, which was more farm and agriculture related, and then also National Plant, Flower, and Fruit Guild, and many more. So in Virginia, the large group that I was looking at was called the Virginia State Garden Clubs and sometimes the Negro Garden Club of Virginia. And this club formed in 1932. And the handbook that Carla held up at the beginning, that was published in 1942, and it had a foreword by Eleanor Roosevelt, First Lady. Of the, of the United States at the time. And the Virginia State Garden Clubs existed as a statewide organization. The last statewide convention I could find was in 1992. So they had a, a, a run of over half of a century. And, and uh, I wanna take a look at the beginning and of the founding and specifically who was their first president Ethel Early, and you can see her in this picture. This is from a presentation um, by Abra Lee, and I love this photo that she found. You can see um, Ethel Early Clark in the center of that image with her dress with the bow on it. Um, and I wrote something for the Library of Virginia about Ethel Early that gives you, I think, a sense of her incredible talents and the reason why someone like her would have taken the helm of this organization that went on to be nationally influential. I wrote, in mid-century Roanoke, Ethel Early could often be found weeding flower beds outside her home. Within her segregated Gainesborough community, teachers knew Ethel as a cafeteria manager. Churchgoers knew her as a constant presence at Hill Street Baptist. Children peeking through the bookshelves at the Gainesboro Library knew her as the vivacious host for their reading is fun holiday parties. But outside Gainesboro, Virginia's Black women gardeners knew Ethel as the queen. In 1927, she founded the Big Lick Garden Club, which was one of Roanoke, Virginia's first African-American gardening clubs. And thanks to her leadership and her small army of tireless volunteer gardeners, in short order, Big Lick made a big impression on city leaders. Their heads turned by spotless alleys, weed-free walkways, and the neighborhood's increasing curb appeal, the Chamber of Commerce and Roanoke City Council suddenly paid attention to a part of the city they had been neglecting. The council tackled overdue street repairs, and they even donated a decommissioned post office to the club out of gratitude. I have a picture of that. Big Lick converted the space into a community center and landscaped it to the nines. At the city's request, Early collaborated with Blanche Davis, who was the president of the White Roanoke Valley Garden Club, and they beautified together the new highway entrance to the city. Word spread across the state from newspaper to newspaper about the way that Early's Garden Club broke barriers and improved the quality of life for Black Roanoke residents. So it was no surprise on the 22nd of April in 1932 when Asa Sims of the Hampson Institute launched the Negro Garden Clubs of Virginia, that Ethel Early was voted the organization's first president. So this was not uncommon at the time. Often uh, universities, especially land-grant universities, uh, would support garden clubs with speakers, with resources, and Hampton University played a major role in Virginia's garden clubs in this way. And I'll tell you, the Virginia State Garden Clubs began with seven initial clubs in 1932 under um, Ethel Early's leadership. 
Within the first decade, they grew to 65 clubs, and soon they had over a thousand members. In its second decade, the NGC expanded to over a hundred chapters statewide, not including their affiliated junior clubs. So the size of this movement, the impact of this movement on Virginia is considerable. And I think it's really important to recognize how these clubs permeated the state. And this, I'm just looking at Virginia in this particular instance, but if you pull up newspapers in Ohio, if you pull up newspapers in North Carolina, you're going to see the same story playing out. Um, how do these clubs form? Well, uh, as in Ethel Early's uh, case, sometimes it was groups of neighborhood women who just founded the club because they had a mutual interest in gardening and wanted to swap seeds or share plantings. So it just happened uh, in that way. And sometimes the clubs were started intentionally by extension agents, especially in rural areas. You might have um, a worker from an extension program at a land grant university who would come into your town and they would host a workshop and they would come and check in on, on progress and coach people in the neighborhood about how to improve their gardens. And then uh, often women would continue to meet after they'd had these initial workshops and follow-ups and those clubs would go on to thrive as standalone clubs. And I have an excerpt over here from Durham County, North Carolina, where they note the interest in home gardens was keener than ever last year with every one of the 200 women enrolled completing the work. The home agent, that would be the person from the extension program who's working directly with women in this community. Uh, the, the home agent was enabled to say in her report, she felt the garden project is at last a permanent activity. And because of it, the problem of an inadequate balanced ration will be in part solved. In other words, these garden clubs were off and running, and there were wonderful, healthy new food sources for the community that she no longer had to babysit. These women had it under control, and uh, they were able to organize themselves and carry on this work further. So those are just two ways that clubs may have started. What did a garden club do? So once Someone like Ethel Early and her friends started a club like Big Lick, which is named after um, the first name of Roanoke. So Roanoke is in a valley area and they had salt licks that would attract wildlife. So the area was first called Big Lick. And so um, when they named their club, they named it the Big Lick Garden Club. And over to the left from the Gainsborough Library, we have a picture right here of their uh garden club yearbook. And they would often, uh, it's not uncommon for a garden club to publish this every year. It was sort of an annual thing. But as I mentioned at the beginning, it can be really hard to find these sorts of documents. People didn't value them or think that they were part of an important story. So the fact that the Gainsborough Library still has this yearbook, it, it's such a treasure. So it holds evidence of what these women did in a regular meeting. So the garden club meetings then weren't very different from garden club meetings now. There were elected officers. Uh, they would host meetings. They might be in a church or in a civic center, or they might be in a personal home. They might take turns hosting the meetings in homes. Um, women would share exhibits. Often you were required to bring something, a certain theme. Like maybe they would have a pumpkin theme. And so everyone had to bring an arrangement that featured a pumpkin or uh, some other kind of holiday related uh, exhibit. They also would host educational talks. There are often records, if you look in the society pages, um, which are sort of like the Facebook of the day, they report all the cool stuff people are doing and what they wore, um, who they had with them, what they ate, um, it's all there. And the society pages love to report on what garden clubs are doing because these women did a lot of really cool things. And they report about who did they invite to come and talk. And there are speakers who are nationally known. They are bringing in people from local universities. They're bringing in people who are experts in a particular craft. They're bringing in um, people who are experts in color and design or interiors, right? It's a real variety. But they would bring in people to come and to speak, to educate the people in the club. They also held annual uh, state conventions, regional conventions, and sometimes uh, if they had a national organization, they would um, rep issue reports from their national meetings. 
Another staple of garden clubs is the flower show. And this is not a casual bring something and set it on the table flower show. This is a show, um, if you can see in the yearbooks, they have specific points for specific items. These were professionally trained judges um, who met whatever the highest current standards were in terms of judging training. And they would host these formal shows. They would often invite the public. And it would be a chance for them to showcase their artistry and their mastery. And then women would be awarded ribbons for their work. Another thing consistently that I see garden clubs doing is conservation work. I don't think I've found a garden club yet that did not have a chair of conservation. And this involved different things. So it might be community meetings, uh, might be special speakers. They might write letters to the editor. Uh, they also held conservation programs for students, special summer programs or outings. They might take students out to see a waterfall or they might take them to a nursery. Um, we have records of this in the Roanoke African-American Women's Garden Clubs of taking groups of students to visit the nursery, to visit the local airport that just installed a new runway and put in some landscaping, right? They're taking kids on field trips, to introduce them to the natural world. They also hosted essay competitions for students. And so this was another way that they uh, opened the door for students to come into contact with nature and learn to love it as they did. And then finally, community beautification, a major cornerstone of every garden club's activity. Uh, clubs like those in the Hampton Roads area in Virginia, we have records of them speaking up, for example, at the Portsmouth City Council meetings. Uh, advocating for improvements, for repairs, for beautification, letting them know our drains don't work. And we're here on behalf of the garden club to say that you're not providing a healthy environment for our children. Fix it now. And they also um, partner with city officials, as I read about Ethel early and her garden club, working with the city council to beautify vacant lots and to create a beautiful entrance to the city for the new highway. So this is sort of a summary of the everyday kind of activity of a garden club. And again, to give you an idea about the national scope of these clubs, here are just a couple of headlines from around the country from the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Up on the top, we have the Stupin Bend and Knotty Pine Garden Clubs, popular with Pittsburgh women. These are all from African-American newspapers. And then over on the right, uh, this is uh, highlighting a year-end party that was held in Lexing in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. And this one has beautiful pictures and images of uh, the goings-on at this garden club party, hosted uh, in the exotic setting of beautiful roses in the landscape backyard of a garden club member. Uh, and then also Pasadena residents set to keep the city beautiful. This is showcasing uh, uh, city beautification efforts. And then Ohio Negro Garden Clubs mark 10th anniversary. Ohio also had statewide organization where clubs could coordinate and meet together. And they were celebrating special anniversary that year. So whatever state you're in, and I know we have people watching from all over the country, um, you probably had a garden club near you that was active and doing exciting things. It's just a matter of digging into the records, and especially newspapers and society pages are often a great lead into finding how these women were impacting their communities. All right, club objectives. So let's go back to um, the document that Carla held up at the very beginning, the Handbook of the Negro Garden Club of Virginia. Again, this document is a treasure. We don't have very many of these. And uh, there are a handful of copies that are left of this handbook in print. Uh, and it is a treasure. And one of the reasons why I love it so much is because it very clearly spells out the values of this group and lets us know what their intentions were as an organization. Number one core value was home improvement, making your own personal home a more beautiful, relaxing, rejuvenating space where you could find peace. And especially they're writing this in 1942. This is the heart of Jim Crow, right? And um, it was not a trivial matter. And Lillian Savage, um, uh, 
who is the um, president at the time, writes beautifully about how beauty is not trivial at this time in war during Jim Crow, right? This is this is a matter of survival and this is critical in importance. It's not an extra, it's not frivolous. And I, I love the way that she emphasizes that. Home improvement. It's not just about making things look better. It's about providing a beautiful space where uh, where you can thrive. Community improvement. These women came together to improve their communities. Improving race relations is an explicit, spelled out core value of this group. And then lastly, recreation and creative self-expression. So I have a couple of examples of each of these just to show you how this played out. So here is a um, home example of home improvement. So this is a little newspaper clipping and this is from Cleveland and it's in 1950. So at this particular meeting, uh, they brought in a speaker who spoke about gardening and window boxes. So these clubs were, they, they were not, uh, it wasn't one size fits all. They, If they were in a more urban area, they might address window boxes. Maybe you don't have a huge yard. Maybe you can still have a garden and a spot of beauty in your home. And what I think is really special about this article is the fact that the Garden Club women specifically included the information that they talked about. They didn't keep this information to themselves. They weren't exclusive and precious about it. They were really focused on um, the public and on sharing what they knew for free, the incredible generosity of garden clubs in terms of sharing their knowledge, sharing their cuttings, sharing their produce. It's really astonishing and very countercultural. So here they are giving instructions on how to make a beautiful window box, how to beautify your home, even if you don't have a yard. Uh, you can consider, you should consider drainage, you should consider the soil, uh, watch that they don't dry out too quickly. And then they suggest some flowers, petunias, geraniums. These make for a beautiful window box. So encouraging women, whatever their sort of yard situation is, find a way that you can bring flowers into your life and make your home more beautiful. Creative self-expression. I love this one because it's so unique and interesting. So this is a clipping from Charlottesville Society Pages uh, in the uh, Charlottesville, Virginia Tribune, which is an African-American newspaper in Charlottesville, Virginia. And they describe a very unusual kind of flower arrangement that one of the women brought for her special exhibit at this meeting. I have it highlighted over here. It says, the most unusual and aesthetic feature of the meeting was an arrangement of various greens, flowers, fruits, and porcelain figurines. The original arrangement was quite characteristic of its creator, Mrs. Myrtle Lewis. As Mrs. Letty Spears read from the Songs of Solomon, the arrangement was turned to show each article mentioned in the Bible as in the arrangement. This unusual arrangement was used to represent the Washington Park Garden Club at the Mental Hygiene Society State Convention Exhibit at the Rec Center. So she is inspired by this biblical passage from the Song of Solomon, and she creates a whole flower arrangement that uh, factors in uh, different elements that are described in this book. And I love that. And I love also the fact that this wasn't something that was just shared in the meeting, but also that she shared it with uh, the convention center and the rec center to share the beauty and the creativity that she had. And uh, because the color purple is out now, I also wanted to mention that if you have not read Alice Walker's um, short piece called In Search of Our Mo Mother's Gardens. Um, that is a really uh, beautiful piece of writing about the importance of gardening in women's lives and in, especially in African-American history. And she writes about how her mother worked so hard uh, and the sustaining influence of flowers and natural beauty on her life and how that was her way of being an artist. And that was her way of creating something gorgeous and meaningful in a world that often um, was very dark. So her uh, quote that I'm going to pull out here says, when will you ask if my overworked mother have time to know or care about feeding the creative spirit through her garden? 
I remember people coming to my mother's yard to be given cuttings from her flowers. And I hear again, the praise showered on her because whatever rocky soil she landed on, she turned into a garden. So um, I'm gonna move now, cause I know I need to keep up here. Um, I'm gonna move now into community improvement. This is a picture I love from the West Mount Herman Garden Club in Norfolk. They are doing a tree planting at a local school and they're observing the principal planting this tree that they have donated. And are their hats fabulous or what? Yes, they are. Um, so in addition to uh, donating trees and donating shrubs to public spaces that in the case of Norfolk were probably not being properly served by the city, uh, they did a lot of other things. Here's a quote from a Norfolk club leader in 1939. By correspondence and visits to our city officials, we've been successful in getting vacant lots clean, better car and bus service, bad conditions and streets and drainage improved, shrubs and trees for public planting secured, unsightly places in the community better, in some instances, the labor being furnished by the city. There's much interracial contact. We're invited to the gardens and flower shows of our white friends, and they visit and judge ours, giving us magazines, plants, lectures, and demonstrations. And that gets into the other core value, which is improving race relations. And garden clubs prove to be a remarkable bridge between women in a very segregated society. For example, I found a record of a garden uh, workshop that was hosted at the Hotel Patrick Henry in Roanoke. The Magic City Garden Club, composed of the leading white women of the city, this is according to the uh, Richmond Planet, which is an African-American newspaper in Richmond. Uh, in 1931, they write that the Magic City Garden Club sponsored a garden school at the Hotel Patrick Henry for four days last week. Four days to teach the women of the city how to have beautiful yards and flowers and gardens. Our group of women were invited also, and several of our women won some of the choice prizes. And uh, I think that this is very, it's important to recognize how remarkable this is. It's important to recognize just how unusual it would have been to bring these women together, to learn together as peers. Roanoke was literally separated by railroad tracks and the Henry Street Bridge was the only way, really, that people could get from white Roanoke to black Roanoke. It was just a deep and visual divide between these two communities. And garden clubs brought these women together and allowed for white women in the city to see the artistry and the genius and the brilliance and the creativity of uh, women who lived in a part of town that they, they didn't go to. And it opened doors, I think, for understanding that were so important in this era. And just as a fun aside, um, Millie Paxson, who was one of the leading garden club coordinators in Roanoke and helped to found one of their first garden clubs, was uh, also uh, very active in the NAACP in terms of improving race relations and advocating for black rights. And she, a garden club lady, was responsible for uh, registering Oliver Hill to vote. Now he would go on to, um, be an NAACP lawyer in a Prince Edward County case that would go on to be part of the Brown v. Board of Education um, case that was heard before the Supreme Court that desegregated American schools. So thank a garden club lady. All right, and then finally in Los Angeles, the Home and Garden Club, uh, the Angeles Home and Garden Club in 1961, uh, was described in the African-American newspaper there as being busy this year trying to complete their NAACP life membership. And you do see this a lot in the garden clubs. They'll announce all of our women are registered to vote or we all now hold NAACP lifetime memberships. They're not just focusing on gardening. They're also focusing on civil rights and justice and mobilizing the women in their clubs to be advocates. And I love this quote also by Camille uh, Dungy, who is a poet and who's written a beautiful book recently about uh, gardening in her own backyard in uh, Colorado. But she writes, every politically engaged person should have a garden, a garden's constancy and also the pace at which a garden will change. These are necessary stabilizers in the oft-buffeted life of the politically engaged. And I do see that thread uh, running through the lives of the women that um, I've had the privilege to read about as they balance their activism with their involvement in garden clubs and how those two really complement each other. All right, clubs at work. For uh, 
to wrap up here, I'm going to take a look at the Eastland Gardens Flower Club. Uh, there's a wonderful book written about it. It's very small. It's from Arcadia Publishing. Go out and get it. It's absolutely delightful and cram-packed with wonderful pictures. But it focuses on this neighborhood of Eastland Gardens, which is in Northeast Washington, D.C. Um, it was an African-American neighborhood that was founded in the 1930s, and it has one of the finest collections of work by early Black architects. So as middle-class African-American home buyers um, purchased lots in the neighborhood, they often contracted with architects who graduated from Howard, and uh, they built a really special bucolic neighborhood right next to Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens. Here's Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens. It's a beautiful treasure. And in this neighborhood, uh, the women who lived in it, the families who lived in it were very connected with the surrounding gardens. They volunteered there. They took youth group trips there. Um, they experienced uh, a lot of fun recreational times in these gardens nearby. But uh, unfortunately, there was about to be a terrible decision on the part of the city that would put all this in danger. Um, and the Eastland Gardens Flower Club formed in the 1950s when Rudine Davis, who's shown over here to the left, uh, invited a DC adult education horticulturalist to run a workshop. So the club launched in 1957. They did neighborhood garden tours. Um, they volunteered at the aquatic gardens. They lobbied to rename local school buildings after black leaders. And eventually Rudine Davis would receive a Women's Doer of the Year honor in 1965 from Lady Bird Johnson for the work that she did in neighborhood beautification. But one of the things that she had to take on was a dump. So if you can believe it, in 1942, Washington, D.C. decides to install a temporary municipal dump right next to an aquatic garden next to this beautiful middle-class neighborhood and right near major waterways in Washington, D.C. Terrible location. Um, and the women in the Garden Club were some of the chief organizers and protesters um, that tried to get this removed and filled in. And it, <laughs> they were active to the extent that they would lay in front of the garbage trucks. And eventually they did succeed in getting this dump filled in, um, covered over with soil, and it's undergoing remediation currently, but they had it converted into a park. And it really was in large part due to the tireless civic activism of the women in the Eastland Gardens Flower Club that this dump uh, was filled in. And they really did put their love for beauty in the national uh, natural world into practice. Um, they put their community improvement values into practice. And this, I think, is an example of real victory. And they eventually... Um, worked with the beautification program, a federal beautification program to, a co to create a cooperative community park and national park service park. Um, and so that's what you see here now in the area instead of that dump. So a victory for um, the people of this community and a victory for the women of the Flower Club, an example of the kind of great work that they do. Uh, and just to close, I'm really thankful. I feel like we're walking into a future where these garden clubs are no longer invisible. In 2022, um, the Ann Spencer Home and Gardens sponsored a wonderful celebration commemorating the 90th anniversary of the Negro Garden Clubs of Virginia, bringing more awareness to the work that they did. And as we move uh, forward, I'm hoping that series like this wonderful horticulture series that you're hosting here at Smithsonian Gardens um, in conjunction with the African American Museum that uh, this will bring more attention to the incredible heritage and history that's been hiding in plain sight. And my hope is that these clubs will no longer be invisible and that people will uh, be aware of the amazing changes that they made to make our country more beautiful, more healthy, more safe, um, and uh, a more connected place. So thank you. Meredith, thank you. That was, Carla, when we retire, we have to start a collaborative garden club, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Let's put it on our list. Yes. Yeah, and Meredith, one of the things I took away from your program more than anything else is the fact 
of the importance of primary sources and uh, being able to get them into archives. Uh, because without them, we wouldn't have these stories. You wouldn't have been able to do the research and we wouldn't have the stories. And oh, by the way, <laughs> Both Carla and I uh, know that we have uh, the Archives of American Gardens here at Smithsonian Gardens. So if anybody would like more information, Zach, why don't you go ahead and put the, the information or the website at least in the um, chat box. But this, the archives and those primary sources are so important for sharing the truth about what really happened. So thank you for bringing light to that. And I hope you all, uh, next time you're cleaning out your attic, look for things that could possibly be given to the archives, wherever you are, your historical societies or wherever you are. Uh, all museums, of course, are always looking for primary sources, but there might be something closer to you that it's more important to go in. And then share the, the information with your community so they know where to find it, which Thanks again for that. But Carla, I know we've both been following. Yeah, uh, we've got some questions. Box. I did want to say I was just thrilled to see um, you talk about the the Eastland Gardens neighborhood. My um, my great grandparents bought a house in that neighborhood in 1906. So like before wow. in the community you were talking about. And it is a very, very special place that has dealt with a lot. <laughs> um, but we do have some um some questions in the chat and i i feel like more will come in as we go um do you i think one of the first ones that came in was about um are there were there any significant wpa projects that influenced garden clubs so um i can say that one wpa resource that's been really valuable to me is uh as part of uh the writers project they sent out writers to collect narratives from people who lived in rural spaces and so there are archives that are full of these interviews where people are speaking rather candidly about the way that they live and they're speaking about their gardens and they're talking about how well i used to belong to a garden club but uh, once the depression hit, I had to cut costs, so I can't pay the membership fees anymore. Or they're saying, thanks to the, you know, current economic circumstances, we've doubled the size of our garden, and they talk about what they're planting. And so, um, I'm not sure about any specific WPA projects related to gardening. Although, I do have one more example. Um, but the writing records where people speak about their homes and their gardens um, has been valuable to me and my research. I do know that in Petersburg, Virginia, for example, um, the uh, government officials worked with the Petersburg Garden Club, the White Women's Garden Club there to help establish a uh, urban gardens mm -hmm. so that people could have a plot where they could plant their own gardens. And they did note that um, the the government took over the program after a year or so um and they said that it was much better run by the garden club women because they sourced all of their seeds from local farmers and they were very intentional about um about buying local and about uh uh improving local business owners um fortunes as well in a way that the the more bureaucratic government system that was running the gardens didn't. So I thought that was an interesting note about Great yeah. Depression era programs. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That is that is very cool. Um, you talked about the flower shows that the garden clubs would host, and I, I have to see this one that you <laughs> explained. That sounds rough. Over the top elaboration. Um, were they like a smaller scale Philadelphia flower show? Or what type of flower show were they? So um often the, the the ones that I've the ones that I've read about would have often they were hosted by a local church. So it might be uh, one club or maybe a collection of clubs from the same city. So three or four clubs from the same city would meet often in a church and that would be the host of the regional organization. And then they would have um, 
then they would have the official show. And sometimes they mention that they've brought in judges from white flower clubs. Mm -hmm. um, but it does look very much like there's intentional community outreach, like within their own community, they're opening the doors so that people can come and see the beautiful arrangements, but also they're reaching across the color line to try to pull other people in um, to participate in the garden club uh, events. And you can mm -hmm. see that go both ways. And like I said, it would be wrong to underestimate how remarkable that is in some of these Southern cities, especially yeah, I, yeah. when we're talking about the thirties and forties. Yes, I, I totally agree. And I've seen some of the recent ones. They are pretty amazing. Not quite the flower show, but pretty amazing. Um, how about were the society pages that published articles about black garden clubs and only uh, published in black newspapers and other black publications? Or where do you see them in, the Washington Post or whatever? That's a good question. So um, sometimes uh, sometimes newspapers that weren't specifically African-American newspapers will publish things about goings on, but you do see the coverage being pretty segregated. So the most detailed, interesting coverage that lists full names and, and uh, activities, those are gonna be in the society pages of African-American newspapers. And um, sometimes these cooperative events that were hosted, you'll see the coverage in the African-American newspapers, but it won't necessarily be covered in corresponding white newspapers in the city. So um, the best sources are African-American newspapers. And thankfully, there are wonderful digitized collections that are available in case you can't get your hands on, you know, print or microfilm copies. There are more and more all the time that are available to look through. And they're just uh, have lots of really wonderful, amazing detail. Yeah, it sounds like you had a lot of fun uh, doing the research, which we appreciate you doing. Thank you. Um, Carla, what, what was the question you'd like to ask? Um, well, there was a, the follow-up was about the racially segregated, like how were, um, what was the percentage of garden clubs that were racially integrated in the 40s, 50s, and 60s? So I guess if you could talk a little bit about the integration of clubs. Yeah, that's interesting. So um, I do know, I don't know if I mentioned this fact or not, but uh, but the, for example, the Garden Club of Virginia, which was uh, uh, at the time a white garden club in the 50s, um, the clubs that were affiliated with and chartered by the Negro Garden Club of Virginia, there were twice as many chapters of those that there were of the Garden Club of Virginia. So um, the, the, just to give you an idea about how many clubs there were. So there were just a lot of these clubs. In terms of how racially integrated they were, clubs tended to be neighborhood clubs. So it would be women from your neighborhood. And because of redlining being ubiquitous from the 1930s on, America, North and South uh, and West, right, um, often had neighborhoods that were uh, that were redlined and that were racially segregated. And so I feel like that really contributed to very uh, late integration of garden clubs. Um, I did see, I did find some records in the 1960s. There was a club in Ohio that uh, that was written about in a local newspaper and they announced that they were launching an integrated uh, garden club. This was in Ohio. So that was an intentional decision on their part. But I think just because the clubs often form organically out of neighborhoods and because neighborhoods were um, artificially, structurally redlined, that that's reflected in the clubs. Hmm. And there really wasn't a lot of integration. Hmm. Yeah. And we'll talk about integration a little bit of a different type, more on uh, uh, sexes, is that I know I've attended garden clubs recently that, uh, in fact, there was a very famous one in the Washington area uh, that was all men's, the, uh, all men's garden club. And sometimes there were couples, and that's what they're saying in, in the question, that it's worth noting that not all garden clubs were and are exclusively women's clubs. The Garden Club of St. Louis was founded in 1916 by couples. The first five presidents were men. And, and it happened the other way, too, that some of these early garden clubs were all men, and it took a long time for the wives to join in as well. Did did you find that in the Negro Garden Clubs? Yes. So um, definitely in the um, in the Eastland Gardens Flower Club, for example, um, there 
the records indicate a lot of neighborhood men were famous for, you know, a particular vegetable that they grew or a particular plant that was their specialty. And they played a leading role. In fact, um, one of the club leaders right now who uh, I had the privilege of speaking to um, later uh, last year, um, Mr. Javier Barker, uh, he's one of the club leaders right now, and they have a longstanding history of uh, men and women being involved in the club together. Um, I also saw that in clubs in Ohio. Um, there's a couple, their last name is Moon. Their son went on to be a major NAACP leader in the 60s. Um, uh, Roddy Moon was the husband's name, I believe. And uh, this couple, they were like a garden power couple. And so they they hosted a lot of meetings, but they're always mentioned together. So yes, that was in fact the case that you did see um, uh, couples and like mixed gender clubs. I think that actually I run into that more frequently, I think, in African-American garden clubs than I, than I did when looking at uh, white garden clubs, clubs during segregation. Um, but uh, that is the case. Most garden clubs, though, that I was looking at, because I was interested in women's history, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was focusing more on clubs that were exclusively women. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, lots more great questions, Carla. What's catching your eye? Um, well, I have one question. Sure. Um, you mentioned a little bit about the relationship between the extension programs and the garden clubs. Could you talk a little bit more about that? And was it a different relationship for white garden clubs versus black garden clubs? Um, so that's a, that's a good question. So, um, I, I am not sure. I haven't looked too much into the white garden club relationship. Honestly, uh, most of the research that I've done has been the work that different HBCUs did with rural populations in starting garden clubs. And, uh, there's, there are great records in, uh, Florida in North Carolina, uh, in Virginia, uh, the extension clubs, because they're affiliated with the universities, they, they're more likely to have records that you can access, um, than some of the private garden clubs that were located in homes and neighborhoods and whatnot. Some of those things have, the records have just been thrown out by families over the years, whereas institutions would keep their records. How many people were visited? How many, how many clubs did we start to do canning, to plant vegetable gardens, to teach people about pest control. So um, the HBCU archives tend to have um, some good stuff about the club work that they that they did. Um, and so I, I'm more familiar with that. But in the case of the uh, the NGC, the V, the uh, Negro Garden Club of Virginia, they were very closely connected and supported by uh, Asa Sims, who was a um, he was a horticulturalist and the, the, he ran the nursery at Hampton Institute, now Hampton university. And, uh, he was an absolutely tireless advocate of garden clubs and of improving the homes and the communities and, um, the, the lives of women through and people through garden clubs. And so there's a very close connection between Hampton, the extension program and the garden clubs in Virginia. Mm -hmm. Do you think that they helped start up master gardener clubs in different areas or? So I do know that land grant universities and the extension programs, you know, they are the home of, of master gardeners. Um, but I, I'm not sure how that uh, I, the program wasn't around uh, that I can tell in the, the schools that I was looking in from this period, from the uh, 1920s through the 1960s. And it, it could just be because I haven't been digging around in yeah. those files very they much. Have two, yeah, they have two different histories too. I know as a as a former master gardener, that's where I started out my career so many years ago. I don't want to say how many years ago, um, but it was really to help the extension agents teach the homeowners more about gardening. So the extension agents would be able to spend more time with the uh professional farms and agriculture, it's still that way. Um, they teach us to be able to answer questions in libraries and different places. So I don't know, it, it, I would be a member of a garden club and a master gardener uh, at the same time, but I don't know if anybody else would, so <laughs> that's it. Oh, how about you, Carla? We're, I love passing this on and off. <laughs> this, you could be reading something while I'm reading another question. Yeah. <laughs> it's helpful. Um 
I do want to, I do want to make sure that I get my question in, um, before we run out of time. Um, yeah. one of those other chapters in the handbook, uh, that we've been talking about all day. Um, what's the title of it? It's, um, like books you should read or something like mm. that. And so I wanted to ask you, what book should we read? Um, I will, you know, maybe one or two that, that, that are important for you. Yes. So I came prepared. Yeah. I, 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 I uh, knew I would be asked this question. So I have some exhibits here. So um, one book that I read recently that came out fairly recently is called Do Not Separate Her from Her Garden and Spencer's Eco Poetics. It's by um, Carlin Ferrari. And this book digs into Anne Spencer and her relationship with nature, her approach to her garden, how her garden informed her poetry. Um, and it's, it's an academic book. So it's University of Virginia Press. But there are a lot of treasures in it about um, African American gardening, and especially about how it informed uh, this artist and poet. And I just thought it was a really special book and an unusual take. So um, I would recommend this one. And book that I read recently that came out in the last couple of years is by Danielle Drylinger, and it's called The Secret History of Home Economics. And I like this one because it's similarly a book that's trying to tell the story of um, the diverse cast of women who were scientists in a way that was socially acceptable at the time through home economics. And so I feel like it's a similar story where you have women who are doing STEM and science research and work and promoting uh, responsible choices and um, respect for the environment. Um, and they don't often get recognized for the incredible amount of work they did. So this is a, another look at, at that. And then this is a book by uh, Terry Spate. And I told her that it had lots of post-it notes in it. And it absolutely has lots of post-it notes. So I love this book. It's called The Urban Garden. And this is all about how to use small spaces um, and to make the most of what you have. And it's so inspirational, especially when it's dark and it's cold outside. You can see how excited I am about getting some of these really practical um, and cost-effective ideas uh, into place to make my house feel a little bit more inspiring when spring comes around. So definitely recommend this urban garden by Kathy Gent and Terry Spade. So those are, those are my three recs. That, that's Thank great, you. Meredith. And to let people know, uh, Kathy Jens uh, was a, a guest on our uh, let's talk garden series of web. Oh, wonderful. And so her video talking about the book and the information that her and Tracy put in there is on our website that people can uh, watch Kathy speak about creating that book and what they learned and uh, what her advice is going along with it. So that's great. Yes. Uh, yes. Terry, Terry's got such a creative, she's got a great blog too and Instagram feed. So um, highly recommend cottage in the court is, is her, is her uh, corner of the internet. Mm -hmm. That's good. So, okay. Carla, which one are you going to read first? Ooh, I, I, you know, actually the secret, the, the secret gardens, the Eastland Gardens oh. book you mentioned in your presentation is top of my list now, because like I said, that's where my grand, my, my family grew up. So that sounds that's, right. that's what's next on my list. Oh, and I should add too, um, <laughs> I should add too that, uh, Abra Lee's, uh, forthcoming book, mm -hmm. um, is uh conquer the soil i think it's it's i think that's the, the title for it. conquer the soil is available for pre-order and i am really excited about that one so i don't have it yet but um that is all about african-american history and horticulture and i will read anything that she writes so i'm <laughs> really really excited about that one <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. She'll be excited too. That's very good. <laughs> That's terrific. Well, I really am interested in the home economics. I'm of the age that we had to take home economics when I was in school. And I must say, I have taken away more from those classes than any other class. And I was a chemistry major to begin with, um, than any other class I've ever taken. I still use everything that I learned in those courses. So um, thank you for sharing that. I, I I wish they still taught it in schools because I think it's a something that you can really carry with you throughout your life. Um, from gardening to home, ec I still remember making my first dinner or breakfast from that, a grilled 
a grapefruit with brown sugar on top and maraschino and cherry. And my father ate it. So that <laughs> great book. But Carla, thank you for, for helping and for being a co-host uh, for today's presentation. And Meredith, I we shouldn't say helping, for driving. You are driving this. And I really appreciate uh, this collaboration and the information that we've been able to share together. Uh, so thank you for that. And Meredith, thank you. Terrific presentation. We are so grateful for your research and what you've learned and were able to share with us. And I know there's more coming out. So as people say, the more we dig, the more we're going to find and the more we can share and bring to light. And that's what we have to do. So thank you for that. But, thank you. And I hope that maybe more more artifacts, more articles, and more primary sources uh, make their way to you and to your wonderful collection. That would be a fabulous outcome that that would make me really happy. Yes, it would. And there was a writer on here that's trying to dig uh, more information up uh, about the clubs in North Carolina. So you've Wonderful. given some clues too. <laughs> so uh, inspiration to all. So thank you both. And thank, thank all you. of the, the people in the audience. Uh, we appreciate your support. And we look forward to seeing you next month for another mm -hmm. Call to Be Talking presentation. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll see you all then. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.